welcome everybody. This is our first set of lecture notes. Those of you guys sitting in class and those of you guys watching uh, the video at home. So what we're talking about, really this is we have to start in the beginning, the beginnings of world history and really history in general. Because before there was history, there was prehistory. There was prehistory or prehistoric times. Prehistory is one of your vocabulary words, I believe. Who can give me a definition, in your own words, of what you think prehistory is? Great. Like like I could not have done it any better myself. Very good. That is the period of time before writing was developed. Excellent. Okay. Do we know, you know, so can anybody give me some examples of some cultures or people or anything that existed in prehistory? Anything. Anything. Did dinosaurs exist? Yes. Did they write stuff down? Well, how do we know they exist, existed? How do we know? How do we know things if nobody wrote it down? Say it one more time. Okay, that's a good a good thing. So, how do we know what happened? Man, I cannot type today. Okay, Mikey says fossils, and Mikey's right. In addition to fossils, there's other things. What else can we find? Artifacts. What's an artifact? What's an artifact? Best definition you can come up with. All right, I'm holding in my hand a calculator. Is this an artifact? Yeah. Is this an artifact? Yeah. A thousand years from now, is this going to be an artifact? About right now. Yeah, it is. It's really just anything that's human made. Okay? So, who are the people that find this stuff? The, the professionals that find it. What'd you say, Grace? Historians. Historians, okay. Historians more the types of people who write about it and read about it and make guesses about it. Who are the actual people that are out there in the dirt finding this stuff and making assumptions about it? It's like Indiana Jones. Do you guys even know who that is? He's an archaeologist. So there's archaeologists. Do you guys like money? You could be an archaeologist or an anthropologist. Archaeologists or anthropologists, what they do is they dig into the earth to find artifacts. Artifacts is a vocabulary word, and somebody gave me a definition of artifacts, and it's just simply human-made objects, like tools, weapons, jewelry. But it could be anything. It could be a piece of clothing, a scrap piece of paper. A shoe, a pot, anything human made can be an artifact. So why do we have two different kinds of people that dig in the earth and find stuff? What's the difference between an archaeologist and an anthropologist? Who can differentiate these two professions? Okay, well, since you did, we'll do that one first. Anthropologist. 
anthropologists, they study, just like you said, bones and other objects. They can also look at the artifacts too, just like an archaeologist. They study bones and other objects. to learn about past people. So there's a certain degree of medical knowledge and human anatomy necessary to be an anthropologist. Many anthropologists are also medical doctors. But they have a much tougher job because they're looking at bones that could be thousands of years old and the person can't tell them what's wrong with them because they've been dead for thousands of years. Anthropologists study bones. So what makes an archaeologist different? What do they, do? What do they study? They just study the objects. The archaeologists study the objects. And based upon those objects, they can make assumptions and determinations about the past. Study objects to learn things about the past. So if we find, if we're, if we're studying, a, looking at an ancient, an ancient culture, and we find that if we come across a graveyard, and we see that they buried their dead, what assumptions might we make about that? They didn't just leave their dead to rot, or they didn't burn them. What, what assumptions can we make? Just by finding a graveyard. Can you assume that they had some sort of religion? Can you assume that they respected human life? Maybe. That they took care of a person after they died? Instead of just letting them lay there? Yeah. There are assumptions that can be made. Just by finding certain things. Okay? Um, so... Archaeologists study the things. You know, if you find a ship, well, maybe we know that they were seafaring people and they did trade. Well, just by finding a certain object, you can make assumptions about things that happened in the past without anything being written down, without any kind of writing. All right? So this is all prehistory. Prehistory. That's how we are able to know things. To know things. Now, what, what the ultimate goal here is, is to figure out how people lived, or their way of life. What's the word for the way in pe which people live called? Culture. Okay? That's the, the, that's the goal. The goal is to learn about past people's culture. And culture is just means way of living, or way of life. Okay? Okay, so questions so far. All right, so now let's talk about the very first human beings. The very first ones. First humans. Okay, before I get into this, you are more than welcome, and I encourage you to have whatever beliefs you want. You can believe anything that you want, guys. The only reason I'm going over this is because it's in your textbook, okay? And the, the state of West Virginia believes that the stuff that's in your textbook is stuff that you should know. Just because it's in there, and you're expected to know it, do you have to believe it? No, you don't have to believe it. You can believe anything you want. That being said, 
what I'm going to go over here is contradictory to what some of you may are taught through your churches and stuff like that. And if it is, I apologize. But I don't want you know, if you don't want to believe it, you don't have to. But is it harmful to you to know about it? Nah. Okay. All right. So that being said, the first ever human beings are called hominids. Hominids. A hominid is simply a person who is capable of walking on two legs. They are able to walk upright. Humans that walk upright. Humans that walk upright. Does everybody understand what that means? You don't have to walk on your hands and knees or hands and hands and feet. You walk on two two legs. Why is that important for human for human beings to evolve? Lots of reasons. You don't have to use your hands to walk. What can you use your hands for? I can use tools. I can learn to write. I can manipulate my environment with my hands. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Okay? Plus, I'm taller. Can I see predators chasing after me now? Yeah, I can see them from a greater distance because I'm taller than if I were, you know, a foot off the ground. So those are all important advantages to human beings surviving. All right. So hominids are humans that walk upright. The first ever human-like creature that archaeologists and anthropologists have found are called Australopithecines. And I'm going to write it down. First ever human-like creatures that archae. I mean archaeologist and anthropologist. I'm going to write scientist. That scientists have found were in what continent? Where did life begin? Where did human life begin? Africa. Africa. Were found in Africa. And they are called Australopithecines. What an announcement. Smile pretty, guys. Okay, so... Uh, they're called Australopithecines. They, uh, a, a, a couple of people, or this group, these two people, they were a couple, a man and a woman, they, they actually found one of these Australopithecines. And at the time they found them, the Beatles, you guys ever heard of the Beatles? The Beatles were a very popular band, and, uh, the, the number one song that they had was called Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. You ever heard that song? And they named it, they named the creature they found Lucy. So Lucy is about three feet tall, and she was a female, and she was believed to be the first, the oldest human ancestor, and she was found in Africa. Okay? Several, she's very, 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 very old. Very old. Okay? Um, so Lucy... Lucy was an Australopithecine. Now, the thing that... So how do they know that Lucy is an Australopithecine and not just some other kind of mammal, primate? Well, Lucy has something that separated them, that separates her from others, and the fact that she has an opposable thumb. An opposable thumb. What does that mean to have an opposable thumb? That's right. That's right. If you ever watch like a chimpanzee or or a gorilla or something try to pick up something like a stick or a paintbrush to pick it up, do that. They can't use their thumb like we use ours. They have to do it like this. So they hold things like this. Whereas we can bring our thumb around and gris, gr grasp things. Okay, which is a big deal because now we have we can articulate things very carefully with our with our fingers. 
Okay, and that, that's something that occurs over time. Okay, so we'll talk more about, you know, because it, it takes a lot to get from Australopithecines to me standing up here wearing a mask and front of a television and telling you about them. There's a lot of things that have happened from the time of Lucy to the time of us, all right? And that's that's something we're, that we're going to get, that, that I'll do next, okay? So over time, more humans evolve. More humans evolve, okay? And the way in which anthropologists describe human evolution is through the way in which we're able to alter our environment, okay? For example, Lucy, the way she was able to alter her environment was the way she could pick things up. That made, it, made her special, made her different. And now she was able to articulate things with her hands. Now, that doesn't seem like a great leap in technology, but it really was. So, over time, the Australopithecines began to realize that they could alter their environment through the use of things that they find. And the next group is called Homo habilis. Homo habilis used tools. You see a coconut? Well, if I sharpen this rock, I can cut into it and drink the milk out of it. That is using tools. Or I can sharpen this stick and I can throw it at an animal and maybe kill it and have something to eat as opposed to just trying to beat it to death or catching it in a trap or something, or using a trap. Those are marks of homo habilis, using tools to alter or change their environment. Okay? Not the greatest amount of technology being used by homo habilis, but at least they began to use tools. Okay? The next group... called Homo erectus. Homo erectus. Here's where you begin to see the use of technology. Now I'm not saying they had iPads and MacBooks and cell phones. Technology at this point could be like a bow and arrow. That's technology. Any, any time that you're able to manipulate your environment, that is the use of technology. Okay? Anything that makes human life easier is technology. Okay, so uh, these are the first people to develop it. They developed technology. Developed technology to become sophisticated. You guys know what the word sophisticated means? Okay. Okay, so if several more centuries, a millennia go through of developing technology till they enter the next part of human evolution. It's called Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens. Homo sapiens literally translates into wise humans. It means it, it's, it translates into the term wise humans. Now, what changes from Homo sapiens to Homo erectus is that human beings undergo a physiological change. The size of the human brain grows larger. Grows larger. Humans... But humans get much larger brains. And then they become capable of things like spoken language. Communication. As opposed to just a series of grunts and pointing. Spoken language. Due to their ability to have a, a much larger brain. Okay. Now, Homo sapiens are broken down into three subgroups, 
And we are in that subgroup. Modern humans are. Obviously, and we'll do that one last. Okay? So in Homo sapiens, there are three subgroups. The first one to evolve is called Neanderthals. Have you ever heard this term? You ever seen the Geico commercials with the caveman? He's a Neanderthal. So that is what a Neanderthal would look like. Got an announcement. Okay, so Neanderthals did something that separated them from just simply Homo erectus. Yes, they were much wiser, they had much larger brains, but they began to behave in a way that set, set them apart from other humans. We believe that they had religion. Now, it's not religion the way you probably think about it, because they existed tens of thousands of years before Jesus was ever thought of, but they still had religion, okay? And we believe that they had religion because they buried their dead. What do you think, just based upon that, what do you think their religion was based upon? What are their, what is, what's, what's their god or goddesses, or what are they worshiping? Nature. Nature. Yeah, they don't know anything of science or astronomy or physics. They don't know where the sun goes every day. They don't know if it's going to come back. They don't know what they're going to eat tomorrow. And so they probably are nature worshipers. Like, oh, God of deer, let me kill a deer tomorrow so my family can eat. We believe this, that they were also very, the sun was very important to them because Every single Neanderthal body that we have found buried is buried facing the east. What happens in the east every morning? That's where the sun comes up. So all their bodies are buried facing the east, where the sun comes up. So that is one of the indications that lead us to believe that the Neanderthals had religion and it had something to do with the sun. Okay? More time goes on, and we have another evolution to Cro-Magnon. Cro-Magnon, Cro-Magnon man, not, oh, I spelled it wrong, don't you spell it wrong, Magnon, like filet mignon, Cro-Magnon, Cro-Magnon, so Cro-Magnon man, he is different because he was capable of working with other people to do things like plan hunts and exchange ideas, and I see that what you're doing, I can watch you internalize it, and then I copy it and do it over here. They exchanged ideas so that ideas could spread wherever these people went. They also developed skillful language so that they could express themselves in a much more specific manner. Planned hunts, exchanged ideas, and developed skillful language. There are no Neanderthals or Cro-Magnons left today. Because during this time, another evolutionary change happened. And it's us. Us, modern humans. Do you guys know what technically we are referred to as? We are called Homo sapiens sapiens. What do you think that translates to? Wise, wise human beings. That's what it translates to. We are wise, wise. Our, our wiseness is so nice, we had to name it twice. Wise, wise human beings. For a small portion of time, Neanderthals, Cro-Magnons, 
and the Homo sapiens sapiens, all species, all of those species existed at the same time. And they battled with each other for resources and food. Now, I'm not saying that a bunch of Homo sapiens got on this side and a bunch of cro magnons got on this side and they went to a battlefield and duked it out. That's not what I mean. But they competed with one another for food, water, clothing, shelter, the things that you need to survive. Well, who was the best equipped to handle the changes and to adapt to the environment? The Homo sapiens sapiens. They were the best at this. They were the smartest. They had the largest brains. They could plan their hunts. They could exchange it. They could do all this, only much better. And so who gets the lion's share of the resources and the food and the animals? And who's more skillful hunters? Who's more adept and able to survive? The Homo sapiens sapiens. What happens to the Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnons? They don't live to pass their genes on, and so they eventually die out because the Homo sapiens sapiens are much better competitors. They're able to compete much, much better. So these wise, wise human beings are modern humans. They're us, you and I. Okay? Okay. Do you guys have any questions or comments about this? All right. Well, if you do, you can feel free to uh, contact me on Schoology or send me an email. And hope you have a nice day.